Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Mark DeVoe and Mark Stay. Hi Marks. Hello. <laughs> hey Joanna, how are you doing? <laughs> I rarely do these three-way conversations but today there's a reason uh, because the two Marks are the co-authors of Back to Reality, a best-selling humorous fantasy novel that they launched. And there's the lovely cover if you're on the video. <laughs> It's beautiful um, that they launched off the back of their of the bestseller experiment, which was a pod uh, is a podcast is. that enabled them to write and publish a bestseller in a year. And many of you I know listen to the bestseller experiment. It is it is a genius um, book title <laughs> and not book title podcast title and book title. As I've said to you guys, you should do one. But let's let's get started by first up uh, explain the genesis of the bestseller experiment. Why did each of you want to do it and how did that weave into your previous experience so uh let's start with uh with whichever one of you wants to go first <laughs> well uh want is a very strong word Joanne. um i was i was kind of just minding my own business when this guy contacts me out of the blue now we, we've kind of known each other since we were teenagers uh, we had mutual friends and a couple of years ago I co-wrote a movie called Robot Overlords which premiered at the London Film Festival it starts Ben Kingsley and Gillian Anderson and it was shot at Pinewood and you know it was an amazing experience and uh, Mr DeVoe here uh, drops me a line on Facebook and says this is amazing you're living the dream what an amazing thing blah 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 and we got talking and we because growing up all my friends said oh, have you heard DeVoe's doing this DeVoe's doing that DeVoe's doing this DeVoe's doing that and he, he was just one of these guys I know is a doer you know and I, I'm not a big fan of time wasters and we were chatting and we were saying we both love podcasts and we both love books and it turns out Mr. DeVoe was something of a writer weren't you Mr. D? <laughs> well yeah something <laughs> I, I was half, half writer so my my whole I've been writing books for the last twenty years, but I never finished one. Oh. Uh, I'm sure a lot of listeners are <laughs> with me on this. I think I'd written about twenty books, but I'd never actually. I got to about twenty thousand words with some of them, and then the whole thing just went. You know, I got I got I, I don't know the squirrel effect. I got interested in something else, and I started writing. And I was so impressed with what Mark had done with his movie, and he ended up having to write a book of the film which was really interesting kind of almost mm. like reverse of what it usually works out mm. and I thought I want to find out more about how he did this because this is incredible <laughs> and so we got in contact and we found that we, it's common of a podcast but at the time I'd actually, I'd actually just designed a course called ignite your dreams because what I what I am really by trade is a coach and uh, I came from the music industry and played Glastonbury. I have to say that because it always makes Mark's eyes. Well. Every, like, oh, look at that. We're not even 10 podcast. minutes in. 10 minutes in. <laughs> no, but that was my dream. My dream, was, <laughs> my dream as a musician was to play Glastonbury, and I, I somehow wangled it very early on in my career. And I thought, wow, what's possible? And I, I eventually wrote a course called Ignite Your Dreams, and it was all about getting people to really focus on something huge that they want to accomplish in their life. And I was looking at what Mark had done, and I thought, wow, here's a guy who's actually done everything I'm, I'm basically coaching people in. Mm. And one of the things in this course, which I look back on now with, with, with hilarity, is that there's three Ds in the course, and the second D is declaring your dream. And I thought, what better idea to actually get to finish a book then declaring a dream to the world that mark and i were actually going to write not just a book but we were going to try and write a bestseller <laughs> and that's how the whole thing started and we called it an, ex it an experiment because we thought well we are kind of like crash test authors we're going to get in the car without our seat belts on and try and bring with us other authors that wanted to try and achieve the same thing mm, so it became almost like a communal effort that yeah. was essential to me because I've I've worked in bookselling and publishing for I've I've worked out now at this December it's going to be 25 years actually I only meant to stay for Christmas, <laughs> and um, I've seen you know the best books in the world that you know that everyone in the office I work for Ryan Publishing everyone gets excited about sometimes mm. they don't work they can be the best written book ever and for whatever reason the public just not interested and uh, other times it all clicks into place so there is no guarantee that this was ever going to work, you know. Uh, so I said to him, look, we could completely crash and burn on this. Just be warned. You know, you can be as positive if you like, but if the, the public doesn't show up on the day, then we're, we're doomed. Uh, so, you know, I knew there'd be someone out there with a half-written book in their drawer who would, you know, listen to the people we've had on the show, be inspired, finish their book, and maybe beat us to it. And the, the great thing is, 
loads of our listeners have you know loads mm. of our listeners have got those little orange bestseller flags on the kindle chart and have sold some quite serious quantities of their books so you know that was for me one of the best things about the whole experiment just uh, you know buzzing with people online and just hearing their stories and hearing mm. how they've been inspired to sort of carry on where they might have given up you know at that 20,000 word point yeah, so, so that does bring up an important point and actually one that is quite contentious in the author community, which is the definition of a bestseller. And of course, I came on the podcast with you guys <laughs> and said, it's easy enough to get the orange bestseller flag. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just choose the right category. And and I think this is actually something that's really being discussed. And Amazon have actually now cracked down on ad, on ads, Amazon ads, that use the word bestseller. You actually have to say the month in which you hit a specific list. And that is, you know, the big lists, USA Today, whatever. So how did you define bestseller? Uh, and how did it go? So people who don't listen to your show would love to hear how you hit your goal. It was always going to be that that category orange flag on on Kindle for me. You know, I mean, that's um, I deal with Amazon on a daily basis in my job. So I know that books that get to number one in the top 100 on Kindle in the UK, at least, are selling tens of thousands of copies a day. So I knew there was no way in God's green earth we're going to do that with book one. The authors who do that are authors who have a series or they're a brand name or they're in a Kindle Daily Deal, or they've got a BookBub mailing. So, you know, that that for us is the next stage. Mm. Um, but in that first year with the debut book on day one, uh, you know, getting getting to one of those would have been mission accomplished. Just getting to one of them, I'd have been really, really happy with that. So but we, we did a bit better, didn't we, Mr. D? Yeah, we did all right. <laughs> well, what's so funny is that when we started this this experiment, Joanna, Mark, Mark was definitely the pessimist, and I was—I'm just an eternal optimist. I think yeah, anything's too. possible. <laughs> go, yeah, go for your dreams, go big, and and you know, you know, if you fail big, then great, you know, you learn something from the process. And so, part of my journey with Mark was trying to convince him that actually part of succeeding in whatever it is you try and do in life is actually believing you can succeed. Because if there's a block right from the outset, that mm. in itself can be the the biggest thing that prevents you from doing it and so i i always but i was a i was this eternal optimist with no background in the publishing experience and of course mark saying you know he'd been working in the publishing industry for 25 years you can imagine he was slightly worn down <laughs> by by my enthusiasm and kept saying this is going to be a car crash and what was what was really interesting is as as we progressed through the first 52 weeks of, of the podcast, I started to see this little change happening, little sparkle in Mark's eyes. Oh, <laughs> don't start that. He started <laughs> to believe that it could actually happen. I thought, I'm, I'm getting on board with this. And it was really, it was really interesting because on the day itself, we, we've got such an incredible group of followers on the podcast mm. and we we did a lot of things leading up to it. I mean, again, everything is an experiment. We got a launch team. Uh, we had about 150 people beta read the book for us. And um, we were trying everything that we'd learned from all these incredible authors, including yourself, that came on our show. And so on the day itself, we hit number one in 10 uh, of the chart, best bestseller charts on Amazon. We only we've only released the book so far on Kindle, so it's just on ebook right now. So and exclusively on Amazon because again, part of the experiment we wanted to understand how that works, so that we could then feed all everything we learned back to our listeners. And we hit that was across the UK, Canada, and the and the US on those different lists. But the biggest thing that happened on the launch day, well, Mark, tell them about tell them about what happened in the the comedy fantasy category that was funny well i we were earlier on in the day we were sandwiched between two of our heroes uh, uh number one in comedy fantasy was uh, uh terry pratchett and neil gaiman with good omens which is one of my favorite books of all time and number three was the color of magic by terry pratchett which again fantastic book um which i love dearly and uh once again did you get a screen print Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we were like every five oh, we minutes. Went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all over Twitter. And again, I mean, you use the word pessimist, Mister D. I think realist is perhaps a better yeah, description. Probably. But uh, we've got it on uh, because we've you know we've recorded our, our our launch day and it's on the podcast this week. Where I I I say very firmly, 
there's no way we're going to get above Good Omens because they're filming it at the moment. Neil mm. Gaiman's tweeting about it every day on set. Forget about it. But what a lovely place to be. Then I miss my train home, um, which is just as well because then it all started to kick off because we actually got to number one. Um, <laughs> and Bo here goes and tweets Neil Gaiman. <laughs> and Neil replies, and, and what was it you said? You said we're not worthy, or so oh, we're going to faint. I, yeah, we're I said faint. we're not. I said we're, we're we're a bit embarrassed. We're not worthy. We're only hanging around for a few hours, and we'll be gone. And and I said unless you retweet this, of course, in which case we'll probably faint. And then he retweeted <laughs> the, the the screenshot of us above that. him in the it, chart. Isn't that the pin tweet on your Twitter profile now? It is. Yes, <laughs> two point six yeah. million followers. I didn't quite realise how, 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 how many of them yeah. bought the book. That's the important thing. I, I think there was quite there was an incredible spike on Twitter. I mean, I was looking at the the Twitter engagement statistics. Mm. They went ballistic. I mean, like ten thousand engagements in in seconds, literally. And and but then he then he put another post which said, "Of course, I need video evidence of you fainting." Mm. <laughs> so Mark's in was it Waterloo somewhere in? I was in, I was in St Pancras. I was in the uh, the Pret a Manger in uh, in St Pancras, and I just had one of me going. <laughs> collapsing um and what? then uh, you did one of you collapsing on your keyboard on my you, keyboard Steve? yes which well, we see, that, that's brilliant and i want to you know stop you guys there because that that's a really important point because what you did there is you know they they called it news jacking a few years ago you know the kind of uh you saw you wanted to also achieve this you know sort of getting above your heroes and but then you also took it a step further and sometimes we don't have the confidence to do that you know pe like people have said to me why don't i ask stephen king on the podcast and i'm like because he's like a god and i would i just would be like hi hi um and and i kind of you know i i'm waiting until i'm someone you know before i ask him <laughs> but it's but you it's, are someone Joanna. Well, you, you know what someone. i mean so you are definitely me. someone but what's good is that you guys went ahead and did that and then you did those videos that's brilliant because you 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 took advantage of the moment and and actually what you guys did also is set aside that time for the launch which you know i'm terrible at now i think it's different when it's your first book but you know i'm like i've put everything on pre-order and then i forget about it <laughs> I'm like, it's done, <laughs> whatever, next book. Um, you know, but what you did there was, was great, um, fantastic. Is there anything else about what you achieved that, that you think is important to share with the listeners? I think one of the most important things was uh, is that pre-launch phase. And because we just had, we you know, obviously this is our first book together, we, we tried to get as much time as possible to plan the pre-launch. But I must admit the biggest thing and I think every author listening to this knows this is that you spend so much time on the craft of writing and trying to you know get everything ready that what gets squished is that pre-launch phase and the marketing phase of the book and I wish now in hindsight that we had had 52 weeks to do the marketing of the book as well as 52 weeks to write because it felt so incredibly rushed um, but at the same time we know that a deadline is so essential with this and mm. I think one of the tips we've often talked about on our podcast is that you know, if indie authors need to create a deadline. And so we work towards that, but we recognize as well that this is, as you, as you rightfully told us, this is just the beginning of, of the process. And there were people laughing when we were putting up tweets and Facebook posts about, we finished the book. You know, we're there, we've done it. And there are people like, going, you haven't got a clue. You're <laughs> just getting started. So we recognize that. I would, I would also process. say that uh, a tipping point for me, and this goes back to <clears throat> when Mark said he saw a change in me, that was when I realized we actually had a good book. Mm. We had a really good book. Um, it was around about sort of second or third draft and we're working through it. And I was thinking, actually, this is this is one of the best things I've written. And it's got great characters. Uh, prose is good. Really good pacey story. Um, I thought, actually, this I'd be very proud to put this out of my name on it. This isn't because of the car crash part of me thought, well, we could end up just putting out some piece of tat out there which has been rushed not properly edited you know uh, a classic kind of hero's journey insert hero into story slot b kind of thing um <laughs> uh, which it which it isn't and it's it, it really is a story that's told from the heart which is one of those i remember we had john conley the the best-selling mm -hmm. author on the show and he was kind of like is this just some cynical ploy to get to number one and ben aronovich said the same thing as well and i no, you know, better on it. I work with him at Orion and Galantz. You know, I know him and I, I, I want to be able to look him in the eye and say, this is a good book, mm. you know, something that I'm proud of. And when we got to the point where I was happy with what we were writing, 
I thought, actually, yeah, this is, let's put the foot on the gas here. Let's actually make this happen. Mm. Well, it's interesting because obviously you work in traditional publishing and actually I listened to some of the early shows of yours and I got the impression that you were looking at traditional publishing and I kind of thought at that point, oh, this is not a show I'm going to listen to. And then I saw that you had some indies on there and, you know, and things started to change. So particularly for Mark Stay, you you know, you mentioned there a piece of tat. Uh, you were worried that you would publish that. I think with the implication that there are many pieces of tat self-published and how d- how did there, that there are there are pieces of tat published across the spectrum joe yeah good uh, this is, i'm glad I, but, you know, but how, how no, did I, I, how did you change your mind basically how did you change your mind about indie or did you or and how do your colleagues in traditional publishing feel about you going indie oh they love it they absolutely love it and the big change in the last two years really has been that uh, rather than looking at it as a kind of vanity publishing thing, they are looking at the bestseller charts for indie authors that they can maybe poach and acquire and but do it successfully. They've been burnt quite a few times. They have mm. authors where where that that category on Kindle is very granular. And the fact is that author is only going to appeal to that readership and they found their readership and they're doing very well, thank you very much. And when a publisher says, oh, we'll go mainstream with this, doesn't always work and i think they've been burnt by that a few times Mm -hmm. uh however there are you know we we were out to write something that is very mainstream and is very popular uh and there are authors like yourself and people like mark dawson and mark edwards and and shannon mayer who we've had on the show who've had huge success with uh with indie publishing and it's um i think you know it was it was talked to shannon on on that show that was a real eye-opener that um the it, it was the fact that she had so much control over what she was writing. Uh, she was writing to a very high standard. She, you know, she had an editor. I mean, there is there is a there is a lot of tap indie publishing. Oh, Let's be abs- fair. Absolutely, it's been referred to as the gushing sewer, <laughs> and there is a lot of crap in there. I did have. I remember having a meeting. I probably shouldn't say with who, but a. a you know, a, a film company, and and I said to them, why aren't you looking at indie authors to you know buy the rights and make movies? He said, we've looked; they're all crap. Mm. This was a couple of years ago, mm. but you know there is it. It uh, is hard. Think- it's hard to find what many would call quality work, and and that is, I think, more and more of an issue, and it will continue to be more of an issue until discoverability is better, uh, which yeah. it's still and I, I think, shit. I think authors like yourself <laughs> and. Uh, Mark Edwards, Mark Dawson, Shannon Mayer, they work so hard to ensure that they have a quality book out there and they deliver on a regular basis and have good series characters, they have fantastic cover art, um, that they are they deserve all the success that they get. And one of the questions we asked Mark Dawson on our show, I said, you know, because he was published by a major mm. publisher mm. and wasn't, you know, didn't have a great experience. And I said, well, you know, if publishing knocked on your door again, would you would you go back? And he said, well, I'd, I'd have the meeting. But he said, I know now know the value of what I have. Mm. And that was a big turning point for me as well, because I think he's right. He, If you are willing to put the hours in, I mean, it's 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 changed me because, you know, I, uh, I've i got a, several projects on the go, um, <clears throat> one of which uh, I'm probably going to do as a crowd uh, f- a crowdfunding thing next year. There's another one, which is a children's book, which indie publishing doesn't really work for children's book. No, I'd love that to go with the mainstream much. publisher. Mm. And there's a series that I'm writing, which is definitely going to be self-published mm. because I can do three of them a year. I can do it completely in my own terms. They can be novellas. They'll be a series. And, uh, you know, from speaking to authors like yourself and Shannon, I'm thinking actually it could be a really good, you know, source of income over the next few years. So it's, it's been a it's been a huge eye opener for me, as well as a lot of our listeners as well. Uh, yeah, especially because many of your listeners are traditionally published authors, because you've had so many traditionally published yeah. authors on. And in fact, I've got new listeners to this show from your show who came from hey, traditional hey, hey. publishing. So <laughs> it, it's really interesting how that shifted. So Mark Mark D, you obviously worked in the in the music industry where indie is actually much more trendy and accepted. So, you know, how was that? Yeah. Was was there even a journey or had you already accepted it? Part of part of my whole interest in moving into being becoming a professional author was because of the 
the years I've been in the music industry and I've always seen the music industry has been a few years ahead of the mm, book definitely. publishing industry. So in some ways you can often see what's coming around the corner. If you, if you, you know, if, if, if an author really wants to be on the ball right now, they should be saying what's happening in the music industry right now. Mm. And I've been, I've been very heavily involved. I was releasing indie albums in 2004, 2006 mm. MP3s, I, you know, direct relationships with iTunes before we had all these distribution deals out there. Mm. And, and I'm also signed to Warner as a, as a songwriter as well. So the experience in that, and it was very interesting coming into the publishing world and taking what I'd learned and what I'm seeing in the music world and seeing the differences. And what we saw in the music world is that when it became very easy to create music, like people could, you know, wouldn't have to go into a hundred thousand pound studio. They could, they could fire up a piece of fifty pound or fifty dollar software at home and create great music. Mm. We then had this huge raft of people creating stuff out of their bedroom, and what actually changed is not, in my view, the pro how great the music was. It's just that there was more of it, and the challenge then became. It was more about how well you marketed yourself and you actually cut through literally the noise, mm. <laughs> you know, in the music industry uh, to get noticed. So in some ways, it became much more important to, to be incredibly good at marketing what you do. Uh, and I talk about when I coach people, whether it's writers or, or musicians, I talk about you can either go down Main Street where everyone is, you know, Oxford Street in England or wherever. And you can try and get noticed with 99% of other people, or you can go down the road less traveled. Mm. And the road less traveled is where the 1% hang out. It's where my, me and Mark, the crazy nutters, I'd probably include you in that, not a crazy nutter, Joanna, <laughs> but like, you know, you're doing it differently. You're doing podcasts, you're writing fiction, nonfiction. You're, you're, you're doing things differently. And in the 1%, it's not a shortcut. I, I say to people, it's mm. never a... It's never a quick route to get to success. It's just as hard work to go down the route. But there's less competition and there's more creativity. And so I've always lived, I always like to think of myself living in that kind of, that, that road less traveled of the 1%. And, and, you know, if you stay in Main Street, basically, if you follow the herd, you mm. always end up stepping in poo. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's what really? streets where do you live yeah, sure, yes. what, where, 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 <laughs> what century side. are you in <laughs> you, exactly Which, so so it's very important i think as, a, as an author who wants to succeed in today's incredible opportunity that we have hmm. to think about what is everyone doing and let's do the opposite or, what... or, I mean, you know, to be fair, though, you did a lot of the standard things for a launch. So just before we wrap up on the launch, I agree with the bigger picture there. Um, but in terms of just just before we wrap up on the launch, because I do have I have a ton of other questions. But um, just that on Mark's day, um, was there anything that you learned from the launch? Like because you're in traditional publishing, was there anything you did for the launch, which is stuff that traditional publishing isn't doing now? I mean, uh, you know, around advertising pre, or anything like that. Actually, the pre-order thing is interesting because um, traditional publishing deals with so many titles that the software they have to feed uh, the metadata and the, it just as soon as the deal is done, it's it's out there, you know, and it's not just to Amazon; it's all over the internet, mm. and um, it's it has an effect on how someone like Amazon perceives you, you know. So you might do a cover reveal, say six months before publication, and you'll see a little spike in pre-orders, but if you a debut author then it comes straight back down again and you start losing visibility on on kindle and one of the things i i remember uh, seeing a talk by harry bingham who is uh, traditionally published in the uk but self-published in the states and he's experimented with all sorts of things one of the things he he said that really jumped out for me which was um don't have a pre-order period if mm. you're an unknown quantity if you're michael connolly or ian rankin or whatever you are going to have that constant drip 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 of pre-orders that keeps you visible and that that feeds the amazon algorithms um so we were very determined to you know day one ta -da, the book is there and then everyone who's been following us on the podcast or whatever they you know they buy the book and we get this massive spike which wakes the Amazon algorithms up and they start going, whoa, this is special. What's what? You know, so that made that made a huge difference. I think strategically that really, really helped us. Although it did cause us some very late nights a couple of nights before, yeah. didn't it, Mr. J? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, on that note, one, what, one of the interesting things we did see as a, as a spike, we actually were number two in the mover and shakers charts in mm. the UK. And we were, we, were, we were kind of hitting in the top 100 in the UK 
Kindle charts. And then about, I think, three or four days later, Amazon sent out one of their, what we thought was a kind of customized email, but it turned out to be one of their standard emails where they were just promoting big, big I was things getting, that were happening. I was getting emails from, because I got it, and it said back to reality. I thought, well, I've On, In a subject that. line. It had a book yeah, in a subject yeah, line. In the Amazon and it email. Had, it had the new Martin Weir Artemis book and some quite big books. And I thought, oh, this is just based on my you know, browsing. behavior. Yeah, Look, browsing. You've browsing been behavior. to the page three million times yeah, since Monday. Yeah, you, you, get, a lot of, you <laughs> get a lot of your own books. <laughs> but then I started getting emails from all around the office saying, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? So I was like, oh, actually, this, this has gone quite wide, actually. You know, so it's, um, cool. Can I, just I don't know how wide it went. But... I just want to circle back on the pre-order thing because people listening um, – you know, that is a good strategy for Amazon. But if you publish wide, as I do, yes. pre-orders are very, very, very important for iBooks, for Kobo. And, you know, no one knows about Nook, so whatever. Um, but iBooks and Kobo, oh, um, well, you <laughs> you can do up to a year in advance um, and they and you get uh, you get double ranking on iBooks and you get um, te- a higher temperature, they call it at Kobo. So the pre-order strategy is very different when you're wide, but I agree that on Amazon, you do that later on um, uh, if you if you are aiming for that type of launch. So I want to circle back to Mark D on the coach thing and the psychology, because one of the things, you know, I, I know a lot of authors these days and a lot of traditionally published authors and a lot of authors who get a book deal and they think this is the best thing ever um, or they have a book launch for their first book and and there is a sense of, of creative disappointment. And you talked about hitting your goals. So you wanted to play Glastonbury. You played Glastonbury. You wanted to get a best-selling book. You got a best-selling book. And, um, you know, there is a sense when you achieve a goal of some kind of, you know, down afterwards. So how was there any sense of that disappointment? Or is that something you've come across with creatives? Or do you just now see your future stretching ahead? <laughs> It's a it's a really great question because I think I always think back to like school productions, you know, that massive build up to that school production. And there's always that morning you wake up after the final big like final night and there's always an anticlimax. And I rejoice in the anticlimax because if you've got if you've had that anticlimax, it means something huge has happened. It's when you had when you never experienced anticlimax, it means that your life is like flatlining. Literally, you're not living. You're just you're just existing. So it's a very common thing. I mean, there's no there's no way around it. What I the way I tend to deal with it is. Um, I, I, I've learned to try and celebrate the moment because I think we're all really bad at actually just stopping. And like Mark and I, we were having cake on our on our launch day <laughs> podcast, and you know we had a big party after. And so I'm getting better at celebrating those moments in life because you know we do. That life is all about the events that we experience and the emotions we experience when we when we have those events. And if we just let that event of a of a of a number one book or even just finishing a book or launching a book or getting a great review for the first time or a love you know whatever it is if we don't stop and actually acknowledge that that is a moment that's worth celebrating then we go through whole of our life not really not really realizing what we're what we're you know doing the things we're working towards so so yes there was a huge i mean i honestly the, the 24 hours after we put the book out i slept because I we started the podcast at I was up at 2 a.m. in the morning having had two hours sleep and then we ran right the way through to like 10 p.m. my time because I'm actually based in Vancouver. I moved moved to Vancouver Island about six years ago. And so we were doing a round the clock um, show, if you like, on the day. So, yeah, there was an anticlimax. And but once I get past that, I then just think, wow, now that we've done this, what can we achieve? And I call it the dream of the dream. It's like you, you have a big dream. And people forget that if you achieve that dream, then you get to have the dream of the dream. It's like the child of that dream, which is usually going to be something even bigger. So that's where I'm in right now. I'm in this space of what's possible. I think, I think, Joanna, that's a, it's a fascinating observation because I've definitely had that. I had that. We had the premiere of um, Robot Overlords in Leicester Square in London mm. uh, as part of the London Film Festival. All my family were there. For, for, all, for all people day. outside the UK, this is where the big film premieres Every are. This is a premiere, big deal, yeah. right? It's a really big. It's, it's like Glastonbury for stuff. musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, afterwards, I'm on the tube, you know, and you start coming down. <laughs> you didn't even get no a taxi. One knows, <laughs> no one knows who I am. You know, no one cares. But there's a little part of me, a little part of my brain, going. I know, I know what I did, you know, mm. um, and it's uh, it's as Mark says, it is important to acknowledge that 
you've achieved something. But also, don't start drinking your own Kool Aid as well. Yeah. You know, don't start believing yeah. your own hype because you've got to work for the next thing. Mm. We worked hard off to achieve this. You know, we put in a lot of work to make this happen. Mm. So I think rightly we are sort of having a little. We had a, the launch day was a kind of pat on the shoulder mm. moment, but now on to the next stage. On to the mm. next stage. There's <laughs> also celebration as well, I think, from, from, you know, Mark and I, all the way through this this journey, we've always been saying we want to inspire other people through our journey. Yeah. And I think the fact that we did hit the bestseller charts means that we've, all the people that have followed us, they can now listen from episode one of our podcast and listen to the whole thing and see exactly how it unfolded. And that's a great educational resource for anyone who's ever dreamt of being a best-selling author i think there's there's you know it would have been a big anti-climax had we have not not made it, it. <laughs> yeah it and actually on the day it was very i realized just how stressful i said to mark i actually broke down when we i broke down in tears <laughs> when i saw our first review go on and the people the person actually liked it because I didn't realize just how much pressure we'd put under ourselves mm. because of the fact that we went public with this for 52 weeks, every week saying, so we're going to try and write a bestseller. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's a very, it's a very important thing to, to set big goals. Mm. Um, but also more importantly, to celebrate them when you do achieve them and celebrate the failure. Because if you fail at something, it means at least you've given it a go and you've learned a lot through that process. Yeah. And to be fair, you could have done a podcast episode on what you learned and how you're going to relaunch in like three months time or something. Because as you say, it's only the beginning. But I do want to um, back on and I've got like rapid. It's, this is why I never do two people, because there's always so much I could just go into with one person. And like I have questions for both of you and we haven't got much time left so i'm gonna try and like let's do some rapid fire <laughs> right <laughs> some ra rapid fire questions okay so um you co-wrote this book and you've both obviously in music and film done co-production -y type things before but um one big tip for the listeners on co-writing mark d you want to start yeah find someone with the same first name <laughs> that's not a tip bring guests, that's not bring a guest on your podcast called mark as well just to confuse everyone yeah. i i think one of the most important things it actually took us and i'll be totally honest about this it took mark and i a year to learn how to write together we now have a mm -hmm. format and a process that works and we had to work through that it was a struggle at times i think every author has to it, if you can sit down i know you've written a book about co-authoring Joanna, which is brilliant um but i think one of the most important tips i learned is that before mark and i started writing we created a spreadsheet we put down everything that we love and we looked for the crossovers so we basically found those common areas and we we have written a book that we both love i mean everything in it is, is stuff that we both love co communally and i think that's how it worked i think if you get two people trying to like write different things that doesn't work so the subject matter is very important from the outset. I would say uh, find what your skill sets are and play to those strengths. You know, Mr. D has a terrific story mind, a good editorial mind. He's very good at spotting all my bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's 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 find find those strengths and, and play to them. You know, it's, uh, it's like anything. It's teamwork. Anything yeah. like anything else. Well, but, but te teamwork is really you, hard. Huh? I mean, teamwork is, is tough, especially when you're I think authors particularly are very bad because they work alone a lot. Authors are complete bloody control, as Mr. D will tell you, you know, uh, he'll talk, a, you know, if he's on, because I usually write in the train, I have a long commute. And if he's still on Scrivener, when I'm getting on the train, I mean, like, get off bloody Scrivener, this is my writing time. You know, it's, um, I, I yeah, I, 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 you, if you're used to being, you know, the sole author, I mean, in screenplays, I co-write, but the screenwriter is way down the pecking order on a movie, whereas author is up here. And when I'm in author mode, I'm lord and god over everything, all my domain, you know, and it's like, well, who's this other person treading on my story, <laughs> you know? Uh, so um, it was it was a bit of a learning curve for me as well. <laughs> it's all about give and take and you find the compromise. And uh, the fact that we're still speaking to each other, I see, I think it speaks, <laughs> speaks yeah. volumes about the way that we've actually found found a great way of working together. But I've just, in, I've really enjoyed working with mark mark is so much fun to work with we mm. chat for hours off off microphone because we just have we're just it's just fascinating listening but you, to all you have stories. been friends for a long time right as well yeah, yeah. we were it's, we were kind of what we weren't really direct friends like we knew each other through 
common friends. So I, I we see him at gigs and stuff like that, mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a real key. Like, I do think you have to have a relationship before you start writing, whatever that relationship is. Um, you know, you have to kind of know that you have something in common before you jump in. Otherwise, it's it's really hard. But I, I want to, we, we're going to move on because I want to talk about the podcast. Because many, it's so interesting. I mean, I would say to people now, like, I'm thinking of starting another podcast around the topics. I know it's ridiculous. You must be mad. <laughs> <laughs> but now I have Go a put team. A cold towel on you, I know. Go sit down. <laughs> but I have a production team now, so I feel like maybe I have more time, oh, so I could yeah. like you know. Um, and thank team. you, production team, who are listening. They are a team, like literally. Um, so for and when I think about the, a podcast that I would do to sell my fiction, it is nothing like this. It is you know more like the Law podcast, which became a TV show on right. Netflix. You know about myths yeah. and supernatural stuff. And a book. And, yeah, and a book exactly. Like that's what I'm thinking. It would be more like that. So um, why why did you choose to do a podcast that basically is aimed at writers to sell fiction? Is part A and part B is, um, and what have you learned about podcasting that you think everyone should know, starting with Mark D? I'm a huge, honestly, I'm a huge, huge fan of podcasts now. Having gone, I mean, I always loved them to listen to, but I'm producing them, I love them. I did quite a lot of radio, actually, in my previous life and BBC and the like, so... Uh, but we didn't realize that making a podcast is a bit like producing an hour radio show every week. It's a huge amount of work. But like you, I've got I've got ideas for podcasts coming out of my ear. I'm like, oh, I could do one on that. But I, I think for us, it was it, it was more about documenting the you know, time capsuling what it was that we were doing and, and bringing writers into the fold. We wanted writers to come on the journey with us. And actually halfway through, I turned around to Mark and said, actually, we we're trying to sell the book to readers and we're building an audience of writers. So we're not doing this the wrong way around, but of course writers are readers exactly, and yeah. they're a great nucleus to start and launch a book as well. But, um, I, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think don't underestimate the amount of work it takes. Honestly, it's, it's a huge, huge amount of work. You have to really be in it for the long term as well. I would, I would also, I mean, I, I love um, the Script Notes podcast, the UK Screenwriters podcast, the Honest Authors podcast. Uh, I've, I've got a lot myself out of those uh, mm. as a writer, and I just thought it'd be great because, you know, the thing is, I work in publishing. I know a lot of people in publishing. I thought, I've not heard that many editors on podcasts. I've never heard a publicist on a podcast. You know, so we, we lawyers, we got, we got all these fascinating I've had people them on in my it. Show. So. <laughs> Oh, fair enough, fair enough. But it's like um, it's like uh, Desert Island Discs. You know, you listen to the ones with the famous people, and they're great. Uh, but it's those people you've never heard of that sometimes turn out to be the best episodes. And I, I thought it'd be great to give people a peek behind the curtain because there are so many misconceptions about publishing and writing uh, that it would be great to you know just just involve people in on that. And I love the sound of my own voice. Uh, so why not have sixty hours of it forever? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait! Interesting point. You just said sixty hours of it forever. Does that mean you're stopping the bestseller experiment? Oh, it's a good question. We're actually running at the moment a, a Patreon campaign. We've decided to. Uh, a lot of people have asked us to carry on, and we've realised that there is a whole other season to this, which is the post-launch and the what we call the long tail. But we're also have been asked about, and this keeps coming up in our reviews. They keep saying this book has to be made into a movie <laughs> and so with somebody and said, you have someone who could do that <laughs> well they see we have someone who's got some experience in that and so i can write said, a movie i can't make a movie <laughs> yeah to be, yeah right so we're looking for yeah. someone mm. so there are there are already people interested in in the in the book as a movie people are sniffing people in hollywood sniffing around already which is really amazing so somebody said why don't you do the blockbuster experiment and i thought oh and no no like, no oh, blockbuster no. died and blockbuster's oh, dead no, that's true yes yes the movie blockbuster experiment. so we're gonna season two we're gonna be starting in a few weeks we're gonna be looking at we're looking at all kinds of interesting things that are coming mm. out of this do we take for example we've only launched the ebook so mm. far do we take the print version and sell that into traditional publishing mm. is that an option um do we you know and what and, and you... about ip rights so maybe you do that in the uk because you both have uk contacts but why would you do that in you know namibia like no publisher is working in namibia but i sell books in namibia so you know um, if you're going to do that don't sell world english guys don't sell world english <laughs> No, no. Don't worry, my agents already point. told us that. Jolly <laughs> good. Excellent. But, the, but these are actually interesting questions. So I, I think it carrying on is a good idea. 
Yeah, so we're running a Patreon campaign right now, and we've, which is basically a kind of could be a model for authors to look at into as well. And so um, we're actually being really amazed at how how many people are signing up and subscribing to that. So we're going to be doing all kinds of extra giveaways and and bonus uh, material for people that can can help us, like basically cover the cost of the podcast. So, exactly. and we're doing it as part of the experiment because we think this could be a model for the future. Authors might look at a model where they get subscribers because it's happening in music. It's well, happening. It, in music. It's happening in it's happening in writing. There are a lot of traditionally yeah. published authors who basically are not making a living from their publishing deals. Like I support N.K. Jemison, who's a multi award winning author who basically, you know, just said I need money to give up my day job so I can write. And she, I think she's making about ten grand a month. Um, some very big name authors doing Patreon. I'm one who isn't a big name, but I'm doing Patreon. And there's lots of people doing writing as well as podcasting. So I think it is already a model for writers and a very sustainable one. Like it's awesome, really. Yeah, we're really excited about that, mm. and um, we think that it could. I mean, it's, we're seeing what's happening with Netflix and Spotify. Exactly. You know, this idea—it's all about content. So, podcasts. I think it's it's a great model for the future. Yeah. So, Mark, stay. Was that a yes? You're going to to do the podcast ongoing, or are you staying quiet for a reason? <laughs> well, I think by the time this airs, we uh, the season two will have kicked off, wouldn't it? it We've already done, got a yeah. couple of episodes okay. in the bag. Right. Um, so people so can we're look always at that. banking stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Well, um, then I did I did actually have one more question for Mark D around name, because, of course, Mark DeVoe is your name. And um, show us the cover again, Mark S, because that's not the mm -hmm. name on the front of the book, is it? It's not, is it? It's not. Let's have a look. Let's... I had quite the journey with this, to be honest, Joanna. The whole name thing. <laughs> it's Mark, Mark Oliver. So Mark, Mark Stay Oliver. and Mark Oliver wrote Back yes. to Reality. So why, why use a pseudonym? I used a pseudonym because I'm also... I'm also a non-fiction author. I mean, most of the books that I've half written are non-fiction books, and I, I'm really looking at inspirational fiction. In fact, I've, I'm already I've got one written for writers around inspirational, fi you know, how to you know get inspired and motivated to write. And so I want to keep my name for that. And I decided on Mark Oliver for fiction. Um, Oliver is actually my middle name, so oh, it's, it's kind of the first yeah. half of my name. Um, but I must admit, we, we went through a huge journey with this on the podcast. You can hear all about it. Like There was one point where Mark and I were thinking of actually going out as a female pseudonym, just a single female pseudonym. And we we're thinking, what would be the implications? <laughs> because because of the fact that the book is uh, definitely appeals to, to kind of the largest group of readers, which are kind of... Um, I guess, uh, contemporary women's fiction, I guess you'd call it on Amazon. And we had, we had a huge debate over this and I went through about three or four different pseudonyms and they didn't fit. And so it that's did really not go I mean. down well with the listeners either, did it? Yeah, it was uh, interesting. There was, a, there was a big sense of betrayal. They were like, no, put what, your to names be, on. To be a woman. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. They were really, they, yeah. they, cause they learned about, and, and we've also got this moniker now of the two marks. It's kind of what we're known as like the two Ronnies, but not quite as funny. <laughs> not as funny. And, <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, we, we've got that as a kind of tag that we're using mainly in our, in our promotion, but um, it was a really, really tough call. And I must admit, I struggled with it for a good month and I'm, but actually having gone through it I'm really happy that I made that decision awesome did, did you have I'm lucky else? enough to have a very easy name to pronounce so <laughs> I'm never changing it and again I said to him I've worked so hard on this my blooming name is going on the cover don't you worry and I, so, I'd uh, spent a whole I'd spent a whole lifetime you know I'd order say takeaway and I'd say Mark <laughs> DeVoe and they'd say uh, how's that spelled D-E-V-O yeah. there's Vox and, and I just you know, I just thought, actually, I'll just make it easy on people. Like everyone knows how to spell Oliver. And, uh, <laughs> Although I guess now you're in them. Canada with French Canadian, you know, not on your side. You'd but, think. But, yeah, you'd, you'd think, think they could but spell But no, it. the world over, no one can spell Devo. Well, that's that why I say um, pen with a double N because you know, can't, people can't spell pen either. I mean, come on. So um, we are out of time. So where can people find... Oh. I know, we could chat for hours. This happened on your show, right? We went on, we went yeah. on long on your show. And people can listen to that if they want to hear us... Um, um, chew the fat on other things so um Great. mark yeah, s yeah, where so. mark s where can people find you and the books and everything online and the podcast uh well i'm at mark stay on twitter mark stay writes is my blog and newsletter uh we are at bestseller xp on twitter and bestsellerexperiment.com uh on the website and we're on facebook uh facebook forward slash bestseller experiment and we are on instagram too 
and for me it's mark uh, my, i actually have a, a kind of coaching company for called four thousand saturdays so that's basically me on the web uh, and four thousand saturdays by the way if anyone's interested in what that is that is the average number of saturdays that we live in our lifetime so use them wisely Whenever I tell someone that, you should see their face. I know, tomorrow. they get very depressed. Do you know, do you know, know. why I called it that? Do you know why? And I tell them, they go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's about being motivated, right? It's yeah, about don't life. worry. My audience is well used to it with my Brilliant. obsession with death and cemeteries and everything. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the show, I think, either before or after you is all about, you know, writing the last, your last will and your letter to your inheritance, your, your inheritors and IP trusts and what happens after you die to all your intellectual property. And it's like the third show I've done on this. So, yeah, my audience is used to it so 4000 saturdays.com dot com yeah and go. i'm on twitter on 4000 saturdays facebook and Excellent. all the usual suspects well thanks marks and everyone go check out the bestseller experiment thank you so thank much you, joanna Jack.